Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast for episode number 132. With Barbara Aerosmith Young, an incredible woman from my hometown, Toronto, Canada, who's otherwise known as the woman who changed her brain. Welcome back. I'm Andrea Samadhi, a former educator who's been fascinated with understanding the science behind high performance strategies in school, sports, and the workplace for the past 20 years. If you've been listening to our podcast, you'll know that we've uncovered that if we want to improve our social and emotional skills and experience success in our work and personal lives, it all begins with an understanding of our brain. I first learned about Barbara Aerosmith Young when researching for Brain Fact Friday, episode number 129, as she was a case study in Dr. Norman Deutsch's book, The Brain That Changes Itself. Dr. Deutsch is a Canadian scientist, medical doctor, and psychiatrist who was one of the researchers who put neuroplasticity on the map, and he dedicated a whole chapter in his book to Barbara's story called Building Herself a Better Brain, which is exactly what she did. I've heard Dr. Daniel Amen say over and over again that you're not stuck with the brain that you have. You can be empowered to change it for the better. And Barbara Aerosmith Young did just that and so much more. Her story just blew me away, literally. It was the first time I actually teared up while researching someone as her story of struggle as a young girl hit a chord with me. The whole reason I do the work I'm doing now is to help educators or those in the workplace to use the understanding of their brain to improve productivity, whether in the classroom or the workplace. And when someone is struggling in this area, like many people who've dedicated their life to the field of teaching and learning, most would want to know, why is this person struggling and what can we do to help them pass this? You can watch Barbara Aerosmith Young's TEDx talk or read her story in Dr. Deutsch's book to dive deeper into her story and learn more that began when she was told she had a mental defect with her brain when she was young and that she would never learn like other children and would just have to learn to live with these limitations. For those of us who have children who need a little bit of extra help, or have worked with children with learning disabilities, we know that many times, even though other areas of the brain are highly functioning and can even appear to make up for those areas where the brain is not as strong, not addressing the areas of weakness, fixing or correcting them can cause years of frustration for the child and it will eventually show up when the brain becomes tired of working hard to compensate for those weaker areas. This even showed up in my results with my brain scan at Amen Clinics with the X test or the Connors Continuous Performance Test Score. It was where we had to hit a key on the keyboard of a computer every time an X appeared and not hit it when we didn't see the X. Dr. Creato, who did my test evaluation, mentioned that he's noticed that people who have weaker executive functions in their brain can develop life hacks to help them to focus and concentrate when they need to, But the problem is that with time and with not working on brain health or function, it will just become more difficult to keep up with these life hacks. Eventually, the brain will not be able to keep up with the hack, which is why it's so important to look and see what's happening in your brain. And you won't know any of this without looking. Just a little bit about Barbara before we meet her. We know she's the founder of the Aerosmith program. There's also an assessment process and a suite of cognitive exercises designed to stimulate and strengthen weak areas of cognitive functioning that underlie a range of learning difficulties. And she's been delivering her programs for 40 plus years throughout the world. Her work that began in 1978 has been recognized as one of the first examples of the practical application of neuroplasticity, which simply put is the ability of the brain to change and rewire itself over one's lifetime. As the director of Aerosmith School and Aerosmith Program, she continues to develop and refine programs for students with learning difficulties. 
Her vision is that all students struggling with learning will have the opportunity to benefit from cognitive programs utilizing the principles of neuroplasticity, programs that change the brain's capacity to learn and open up these learners to a world of possibilities. Sadly, Barbara grew up at the time when most medical experts believed our brains were fixed. So she had to defy the odds and find solutions to overcome her learning challenges on her own. Let's meet this extraordinary woman from my hometown, Barbara Errol Smith Young. Welcome, Barbara. I am so grateful to have found you. And it started when I read Dr. Deutsch's book, The Brain That Changes Itself, when chapter two of that book was dedicated to your story. So I saw Toronto, where I grew up and went to school, and then Peterborough, where you were raised, and I still send some Christmas cards out that way. And now I wanted to know your story. And then it got deeper. I saw that you also attended OISE's Faculty of Ed, where I did my teacher training. And then I had an interest in students with learning disabilities. And then your story just brought tears to my eyes. I'm sitting here researching for my next podcast, thinking, who is Barbara Aerosmith Young? I need to meet her. And um, so it just all started to unravel here. So thanks so much for being here today to speak with me. It's my absolute pleasure, Andrea. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, let's get straight into the questions. Barbara, can you share what you were told about your brain and learning when you were in first grade about the mental block and the challenges that you had growing up at a time when doctors believed that our brains were fixed? Well, it, it, it my challenges actually started a little bit before I actually even got into school. I was incredibly clumsy and awkward because there was part of my brain I later learned that didn't kind of register where my body was in, in space. So there were some indications there, not around academics, but you know that maybe something was a little, little off. But it certainly became crystallized when I started school and, and in grade one where there are expectations that you know people are going to learn how to read and to write and do arithmetic, uh, all, all areas that were, were challenging. So my, you know, my first intimation that something was off was you know, seeing all the students around me being able to learn how to read, learn how to write and learn how to do basic addition and subtraction and I couldn't, like I, I really struggled. So to me, nobody had to tell me in grade one that something was different because I could observe that something was different. And I really wanted to learn like the other children were, uh, and I wasn't able to. Um, so that was kind of the first indication. And then I, I remember hearing my grade one teacher tell my mother, that I had a mental block. So that was when it was first, something was identified. Um, and, you know, I was quite literal because one of my problems was comprehension and understanding and kind of making connections and seeing relationships and cause and effect. So I actually thought I had a wooden cube, you know, like a child's cube of wood in my head because that was what a mental block meant to me. So, you know, as I grew up, I discovered, no, I didn't have a piece of wood in my head, but ultimately I discovered I had blockages in parts of my brain. They weren't learning in the way they were designed to. And as, as you noted, um, you know, earlier that at that time, because it was in the late 1950s, the belief was your brain was fixed. So I feel like I was given a life sentence in grade one. The other thing my teacher said to my mother was, don't have high expectations for your daughter. Basically, all of her schooling is going to be a struggle and she probably won't amount to much, right? And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, I mean, I didn't quite understand all the implications at the time, but it, it did. It felt like I was given a life sentence of, you know, accept your limitations, live within your limitations, everything is going to be a struggle. Um, and certainly the part that that grade one teacher was right about, everything was a struggle. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, schooling for me was, you know, was an incredible struggle. But I just feel how how sad to be given a sentence in grade one. And 
and that was the common wisdom at that time. So, I, you know, I can't fault my teacher. That was the belief that, you know, if there was, you know, problem with learning and whether it was part of your brain or not, because people weren't even looking at learning related to the brain at that time, there was really nothing you could do, right? Like, you know, there were some kids that, you know, did well in school and there were other kids that, you know, were slow learners or struggling or had a mental block. And I was put in that category. And in grade one, you know, there were reading groups and I was in the turtle reading group. Group. And I don't know how teachers thought that, you know, that these labels masked, you know, what, what those groups were like, there were the squirrels and the rabbits and the turtles. And all I had to do was look at my other turtles and see how we were struggling to realize, you know, that's not really the group that, that one wants to be in. So, you know, so I was, I was a turtle, but I like to think that, you know, that concept of slow and steady wins the race. So maybe it wasn't so bad being a, being a turtle. Um, but that was, yeah, that was the beginning of, of my experience in school. And as children with learning difficulties do, I developed strategies, you know, like hiding out in the washroom. I put up my hand and I think my teacher was happy because if I was in the washroom, she didn't have to, you know, see my struggles. And I think she really, truly felt um, uh, challenged, right? Like, I mean, she wanted me to learn, but she didn't know what to do to help me learn. So it worked for both of us. If, if I was in the washroom, I wasn't getting frustrated and, and you know, bursting into tears, which I often did in grade one as well. Um, and then she didn't have to to cope with that. So, you know, that, that you know, I probably spent half of grade one uh, in, in the washroom. And then I learned um, to, you know, fake my fake illness, right? So I would take my thermometer, put it on the light bulb and make sure I got just the right temperature that my mother wouldn't take me to the hospital, but she let me stay home. So, you know, what I say to the students I work with that have learning difficulties, you know, I've, I've probably tried all the things that they try uh, to um, avoid the, the, the difficulties and, and that's the part I love about my work is when I get to go around the world and meet the, the students in the program and hear their stories because, you know, I was one of those students. So mm -hmm. that was that was my beginning in school. Oh, my goodness. This is where it's heartbreaking for me as a mom with a, with a child who struggles as well. There's some tummy aches all the time and just the extra effort and knowing that she'd rather accelerate like her sister why does why can she read faster than and learn faster why does she get a hundred every time and i have to sit and work so hard so this is where i started to make connections with with my own kids everybody's different and learns in a different way and it just broke my heart even now hearing you know the social and emotional side of it when you're supposed to be um, you know, feeling good about yourself that you're hiding out in the washroom and and mm. trying to find a way to avoid it just this is the heartbreaking side. But this, I guess, is what built the backbone for what you've created. When I look behind you, Aerosmith School, 40 mm. year anniversary, this mm. is it's just going to unfold an amazing story that it just kept getting more inspiring. And the more videos I watched and watched kids in different parts of the world. We're, we're talking about Australia and the UK, and they're all talking the same thing, saying, mm -hmm. you know, it, why was it so hard for me? They're talking the language that we recognize. So can you just go and, and explain specifically what things you noticed were, were hard for you in first grade, thinking about our students today with a challenge? Absolutely. So kind of the basic acquisition of academic skills. So I struggled to write and I did all the mirror writing, right? So I, I wrote numbers backwards and upside down. I mean, the, the benefit today is I can read upside down and backwards and, you know, however you present symbols, I can read them, but it, it wasn't so ideal, you know, in, in learning. Um, yeah, so I, I, I wrote backwards. And then when I would add two numbers, so if you gave me 12 and 14, I might add the four and then the one and then the one and then the two, like, it, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of meaning in my world, a lot of understanding, really comprehension. Um, and so, you know, I've got some of my notebooks from my early years and they have all sorts of red X's through them. And then teachers comments, you know, if, if Barbara just paid a little more attention, she would have done better or, um, 
I, I can't remember all of them, but basically attributing it to my lack of will or effort. And I was working really, really hard. I just couldn't, couldn't do the work. Um, and then reading, again, I would reverse. So was would become saw. Um, and that's just, you know, how I understood things. And and again, the t- my teacher would get frustrated because she thought I was doing this intentionally, like, you know, and, yeah. and my notebooks would be really messy, right? Because it was so hard to write and then things were reversed. And um, and let me tell you, I mean, I, I wasn't trying. I was trying to do it correctly, but this is how my brain processed information. And my mother was a teacher and an educator. And in fact, she uh, won an award in the whole province of Ontario, where, you know, I'm from and you, you grew up in. Um, for her contributions to education. So I was really lucky that my mother was an educator. I didn't appreciate it necessarily at the time because my school was right across the street from the house, right? You could look out the, the living room window and you could see see my elementary school. So I would come home at lunch and my mom would have flashcards, right? Because she was determined that her daughter was going to be able to read and write and do arithmetic. So there, there were, were flashcards at lunchtime. I'd come home after school, there were flashcards. So I sort of joked that I became a workaholic uh, in grade one. And you alluded to like the heroic effort that it takes, you know, the, the things that students without learning difficulties can do naturally, a student with a learning difficulty has to put in 50, sometimes 100 times more effort to do that kind of learning. So with my mother's determination and dedication, um, I did eventually learn how to read and I learned how to write correctly and, you know, the correct direction and orientation. And I learned to do basic mathematics. So, you know, she gave me those foundational skills. However, the learning difficulty was still there. Um, And really how it manifest was in comprehension. So now I could read the words. um, I could learn the, the basic procedures in mathematics, but I had no idea of the why behind things, right? So for me, if somebody said, you know, it's raining outside, I could understand that because I could conjure up a visual image, like it was very concrete. But as soon as something became abstract or relational, like, you know, that my uh, mother's sister is also my aunt, I thought like, how can somebody have two relationships? It makes no sense to me. Um, so I, I was incredibly concrete and literal, you know, in, in my my understanding of the world. And I didn't understand why things happened. Like I, I like cause and effect, you know, like there was no cause and effect because for me, there were no relationships in my world. I didn't see how things connected. And I used to think that there was someone pulling strings somewhere and everything was random. So imagine living in a world where you feel like the ground is constantly shifting under your feet and there's never any certainty. And that, that, that was my, my experience. I didn't understand what people meant when they spoke to me. Um, I learned early to smile a lot because I discovered if you smiled, people thought you understood and they kind of leave you alone, you know, or hide out at the back of the classroom. So again, I developed all these these strategies, but I was really frightened. I was frightened if somebody asked me a question, like I'd have to kind of stop. It's almost like it was listening to a foreign language. I mean, the words were English. I knew what the words were, but to attach meaning to them, I struggled. So it was like my translator was broken. Um, so I would just hope people wouldn't kind of, you know, dig in or, or you know, further explore that, that question because um, I wouldn't know exactly what they were asking. And I did have a really good memory. So I had a good auditory memory and a good visual photographic memory. And as students with learning difficulties do, we use our strengths to compensate for our difficulties. So let's say, you know, you had asked me a question and I'd smiled and I'd walked away. I would have memorized that question. And for the next hour, I would have played it over and over and over again, trying to figure out what did Andrea really mean by that? Like, what was she asking me? And Sometimes I couldn't figure it out, but even if I could figure it out, you hadn't waited an hour for me to figure it out to, you know, hear my answer. And then even if you had, and then you asked me another question, I'd have to play it over again for the next hour. So incredibly socially isolating. I had this image growing up that, you know, there was a banquet going on, you know, and, and 
I was on the other side of a plate glass window and the banquet was on the other side. And there were all these people I could look at and they were smiling and talking and having a wonderful time. And I had my face pressed up against the window wanting to be part of that, but I couldn't because I couldn't understand what was happening. And so not only did I struggle academically, but I struggled in, in social relations. And then that, that piece that I talked about that showed up before school, my lack of coordination, which was another area of difficulty, I was terrible at sports. Like nobody wanted me on the sports team because if a ball was coming at me, I had no idea where I was in relationship to that ball. And often it would end up connecting with some part of my anatomy um, very painfully. So I'd want to run in the other direction. So I understood why nobody wanted me on their sports team. So I, you know, I felt really um, very unhappy and very isolated and and um, and I learned you know to use my memory that that's mainly you know I would memorize my notebooks I would start at page one and I had this whole process that I would go through and memorize every single page and put page one with page two with page three and then when I went in to write an exam you know I would look at the question close my eyes flip through my notebook and try to find a match between the question and uh, what I saw in my notebook. And sometimes I made a great match and I got 100%. And sometimes I made a terrible match and I got like zero. And my teachers would think, oh, she didn't work for that zero. Well, I worked equally hard to get that zero as I did to get the 100. I just made a poor match because I didn't understand the question. So, you know, I talk about living in a fog. That was my experience. I felt like, you know, I, I was just in this fog of confusion and you know, struggling with comprehension, wanting to relate, not being able to relate. And that, that, that was my world. Oh, Barbara, it's heartbreaking, it's frustrating. And then I understand from a mom's point of view, trying to teach you with the flashcards, because that's no different from what I've been doing with my youngest all through school, trying to support her. Um, knowing like, why is, why, why can the other daughter get everything easily? I just need to work a bit harder. And then we just figured out working harder is not it. We don't need to sit and read more and, and ask her more questions. It would, it, we just hit a wall. And so everything you're saying for someone who has someone who has something that they need help with in the brain, I still am not sure what it is with my youngest. We're still going through testing and we're isolating different parts. We, we think it's to do with reading. We've figured that part out, but everything you're talking about, the frustration that the child feels, having to work harder, not belonging. And then can you just share, like I know we're gonna get to the solutions because that's where I'm so interested to even dive a little bit deeper and see, you know, what else I could be doing over here. But just just explain what happened in eighth grade, because this is where all my work has been focused on. It's the self-esteem of our young people, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we're growing up, we already have a difficult time and you are having an even more difficult time. So things reach the lowest point for you in grade eight and you just mm -hmm. couldn't see how you're going to be able to go on. But your father an inventor helped you to adopt the mindset you'd need to soldier on. So when I heard what he told you, it made me feel even more connected to you because when I moved to the US, one of my friends from Toronto gave me this mouse pad and it had the saying on it that your dad told you and it's helped me so many times when I've had challenges, but can you share what did he teach you and how did this help you to move forward? Sure, it, it yes, and as you say in grade eight, it was a thought of, you know, I struggled through elementary school. Now I was going to high school because I hear that's grade nine is high school. And I thought, you know, with multiple subjects and first of all, would I even find my locker? Because I another problem I had, I always got lost because um, I didn't understand, you know, um, space. And yeah, so it was a really, really low point. I just incredible despair. And my father um, said to me, he said, you know, if there's a problem out there in the world and there's no solution currently to that problem, he said, it's, it's our responsibility to go out and find a solution. And then he said something that I've held dear to my heart. He said, if the rest of the world tells you you can't do it, don't listen. So this is how science goes forward. And so I thought, okay, I have no idea, you know, how I'm going to do this at all. Certainly, certainly at that point, and I was, you know, insignificant despair, but it was like my my touchstone that there 
there must be a way to find a solution. And certainly I didn't find it at that point, but it was always, it was like a quest, right? That that don't don't accept that nothing can be done. It's it's you know hunt to see if something can be done, if there is a solution. And it wasn't until many many years later that that you know somebody put a book in my hand that changed my life that you know that led to the solution, the work of uh, uh, the Man with the Shattered World, the book by Alexander Luria. Um, but it was that that possibility, you know, kind of like that, that growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about, like that, that possibility that this doesn't have to be fixed, you don't have to live within these limiting beliefs, that, you know, it gave me a glimmer of hope. Um, and, you know, schooling continued to be to be a struggle. Um, but there was that, that hope that maybe there was a possibility that I could find something that could, uh, you know, help alleviate my challenges and my struggles. So I, I'm, you know, really, really grateful to both of my parents, you know, my mother from the education part and my father, you know, from that creative science piece. And the other thing that he really distilled in me, um, he was a, a design engineer and had all sorts of patents. Like he, he conditioned electricity, whatever that means. Um, but apparently anytime you're in a train and it accelerates or decelerates, that's some of his work. Um, and, but he would come home with these blueprints, right? And he'd lay them out on the living room floor. And I caught his excitement for the creative process. Like he, you know, he tried to explain it to me, but I couldn't understand, but I could feel his, his excitement in, you know, creating something that didn't necessarily exist before. So that was, um, you know, I had that deeply embedded in me and that certainly was, um, you know, gave me a lot of hope for the future. Oh, that's where it caught my attention here. And it kind of blew my mind when I saw your dad as the inventor, because you needed really to be at a place where you're inventing something new um, for yourself. And so it, it just blew me away. And and then you, you, how did you get this book of Alexander Luria and the psychologist Mark Rosenzweig? Like back then, how did you find out about all this without, you know, going to Google and looking on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're sort of the dark ages, right? There was no no Google, no internet. Uh, it I was know. like it, it, this this is emblazoned in my memory. It was August of 1977, and at the time I didn't know, but that's when Luria died, right? That that somebody handed me his book, and it was I was in graduate school. Uh, studying school psychology because if I look at you know I went into my undergraduate was uh, child studies and then my graduate degree was school psychology I was trying to understand what was wrong with me right because I you know in in child studies it's you know part of understanding how children learn and then school psychology part of that is you're identifying learning difficulties um, and just a little aside you know I went to all my professors when I was at school psychology at, at OIC at University of Toronto and said um, after I'd read Luria's work I said now I understand what my problem is like it's part of my brain that's not not working and I have a learning difficulty and I remember to this day my professor saying well you couldn't be in graduate school and have a learning difficulty because at that time there wasn't the concept that you'd be gifted and have a learning difficulty like it just didn't exist so so you know I couldn't have a learning difficulty. And then the next thing they said, and even if you did, it has nothing to do with your brain. So this work doesn't apply. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, right? But then I remembered what my father said, you know, if people say you can't do this, don't listen, go out and try. And this is how science goes forward. So yeah, so it was a, it was a fellow student that, um, not sure exactly why, but he was just, you know, he was aware of Alexander Luria's book and I was, you know, describing some of the challenges that I had. And he said, I think you might be interested in this book. And I dedicate my book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain to Luria, because I feel like I owe a life debt to him. Uh, if that person hadn't handed me that book, I don't know if I'd still be here today. Cause I again was in a, a really dark, period. Um, so, you know, finding graduate school is so difficult. I was working 20 hours a day just to tread water in school, sleeping four hours a night. I compromised my immune system. I got very physically ill. And this book, 
gave me a window into my difficulties because if you're going to solve a problem, you have to understand the nature, right? And I knew I had a problem, but I didn't know what was the source of the problem. Now on reading this book, which told the story of a Russian soldier that had a head wound during World War II and this man was keeping a journal. So he was describing his struggles. And then Lurie was explaining what was going on in the man's brain. And I knew I didn't have you know, a piece of shrapnel in my brain, but everything this man couldn't do after his wound, I hadn't been able to do since birth. So for me that identified as my brain, it's parts of my brain that aren't working. And Lurie helped me understand that as did this Russian soldier. And then the next piece was Mark Rosenschweig's work that, you know, so when I got curious about this, I thought, okay, you know, um, is there something that can help me understand what I can do about this? And Rosenschweig was working with rats and exploring this concept of neuroplasticity, which this was 1977. This was the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. There still was not a belief that neuroplasticity you know, was part of our human experience. There certainly wasn't widely believed. And I thought if rats have neuroplasticity, which Rosenschweig proved, you know, you give them lots of stimulation, they become better at learning mazes. And when you look at their brains, their brains have changed physiologically, right? They, they've got more dendrites, so more synaptic connections, more neurotransmitters. So if you're rats can do that, surely humans can do that. And again, all my professors you know, said to me at that time, well, no, there isn't human neuroplasticity. But again, I thought about my father and I have to try something. So to me, the, the, those two pieces coming together at the, the same time, first identifying this is my problem, and then identifying that there's neuroplasticity. So our brains aren't fixed. And I figured I'm gonna try an experiment. I'm gonna be one of those little rats, you know, that, <laughs> that you know, so I was my first experimental subject and I had no idea if it would work, you know, and here I was, I think 25 or 26 years old. I still couldn't tell time because to tell time to read an analog clock, you have to understand the relationship between the hour hand and minute hand. And my problem was so severe, I couldn't even, grasp that relationship. So I thought, and Luria talked about somebody with this difficulty can't tell time because they can't see those relationships. So I thought, what do I do? Like, I want to make my brain work, like kind of do weightlifting for the brain. And I thought, I'm going to invent an exercise with clocks, right? Not because I want to learn how to tell time, but to force my brain to process relationships. And I figured, can't tell time. So if this doesn't work, I've just lost time. And, you know, <laughs> so it's worth trying. And, you know, the first several things I tried didn't work. You know, I was wearing two watches on my wrist, you know, an analog and a digital and comparing them. But over time, and this experimental process, you like you try things, you have a hypothesis, doesn't work, then you refine it. I, I came up with what changed my brain and proving that there was human neuroplasticity because it was like you know when I reached a first a certain level in the exercise and I worked like hundreds and hundreds of hours on this um, I realized there was human neuroplasticity because I could do things that for 26 years with the best will in the world I had never been able to do I could listen to a conversation I could understand what the person was saying I could make a comment back I could understand their comment back I was part of human discourse for the first time in my life it was profound I understood why people did things I understood you know if somebody was conning me or was it somebody that I could trust before? I, I couldn't understand that because I didn't understand, you know, the logical inconsistencies in what somebody was saying if they were a con artist. Um, I could understand mathematics. I could read a page in a book and I could understand it as I was reading it before I might have to read that page 10 times to try to figure out what it was saying. It like it was profound. Um, and when I saw that change, I thought, okay, I have that, that problem where I'm really clumsy. I have that problem where I get lost all the time. I went back into Luria's uh, writings. I bought every book that he has that's translated into English because he's he was Russian. Um, and if you look at my books, they're like highlighted in multiple colors with diagrams and pictures. <laughs> And so I tried to figure out, okay, what's going on spatially? What's going on in terms of my kinesthetic perception? And I created exercises for those two areas. And now I can read maps. I don't get lost. I can do geometry. I can do geography. Um, you know, I go all around the world and, and I can navigate. 
Um, and with the kinesthetic piece, I can actually play sports and I had never been able to play sports. I'll never be a gifted athlete and I don't bump into walls or door frames. I'm not accident prone. So it was clear like with different exercises, working different parts of my brain, I had demonstrated there was human neuroplasticity. And when I saw those benefits for myself, rather than just saying, this is great, I'm happy, you know, I'm just gonna do whatever in the world. I thought I have to take this out into the world to help other people that were struggling either in the same way as I was or had different learning difficulties. And that was, you know, the, the beginning in 1980, I set up Aerosmith School in Toronto, um, to help other people. And then in 1996, thought I have to take this work out of my school. And I started working with educators around the world. And we're now in 12 countries in 90 educational organizations. And our, our goal is to make this work accessible around the world to you know, help students uh, that are struggling and, and transform their future. Mm -hmm. Oh, just brings tingles to my spine because I had no idea that that this school existed, that it was in my hometown. And as I watched your website, learned about the students that you're helping all over the world, I thought, this is it. This is the missing piece. And and so I just wondered, like, how could teachers or schools that want it become connected to you, how can they do that and be one of the sites listed? Because I didn't see any in Arizona, any connections. So yeah. I just wonder how could we get some more people um, where I live and anyone listening? Yeah. So the, the first step would be contact us. Like, so the, the, I think the email is info at aerosmithprogram.ca or just go on our website and find any email address and, and reach out and contact us because we that's what we want to do is have conversations with educators around the world to see how we can get the program implemented in their school. So our model is to train teachers. Um, obviously, we have to have an agreement with the school that, that they want to implement this program. Uh, and once that's in place, then they will provide teachers that we, we train. And then the program is delivered right within the school. And we have several models. So we have what we call a cognitive classroom. The teacher is trained. There's a classroom within the school and the students filter in and out of that classroom over the course of the day. So there could be students in grade one and grade seven and grade six all in that classroom at the same time. And each one is working on their own individualized program. And the goal of the program is not compensation. It's not workarounds. It's not teaching skills. It's not teaching content is changing the student's brain so they can learn the content or the skills or the curriculum. And so the students, the idea is they, you know, they might come in for one or two or three periods over the course of the day. And each one, they'll be working on a cognitive program that's specific to their needs. And we do a, an assessment that looks at that. And then, then they're back in their regular classroom for the rest of the day. And over, you know, it might take two years, three years, four years, depending on their cognitive profile. And by the end of the program, those cognitive functions are in place, they're solid, and the student doesn't need any further support for the rest of their educational career, because now their brain is capable of doing all the things that are required by the learning process. And then another model that we have that we just started a few years ago, um, I call it the whole cohort. So the idea is in grade one, all the students in a grade one class are working 30 to 40 minutes a day on one cognitive exercise. And we've done this in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, in Canada, in the United States, in Madrid, in Spain. Uh, and I have a whole plan. So in grade one, we would work on motor planning. So every child benefits, not just children with learning difficulties. Um, and then in grade two, we work on the visual memory because that's critical for reading, spelling. Grade three, we do quantification sense, which is critical for numeracy. Grade four, we do the reasoning. So I have a whole plan. Like in each grade, we work on a different cognitive function because I figure we go to school to learn. We learn with our brains. Why not put the brain into the education equation, right? That, that we go to school not only to learn curriculum, but to work our brains to make it stronger, to be able to not just learn curriculum, but all of learning. Um, so, so I welcome any educator out there anywhere in the world to reach out, email us, start a conversation. 
and um, see, you know, how we can work together. And I would say to parents, if there are any parents listening, I'd say a lot of the, the schools that have taken on this program around the world, it's been parent advocates. A parent goes and knocks on the principal's door at that school and says, I've heard about this program. Here's the research. And we have lots of research, both looking at what's happening in the brain, looking at what's happening on cognitive outcomes, academic, social, emotional well-being. And say, hey, you know, do you want to look at this program? So parents have power, like, you know, educators listen to parents. Um, so as a parent, go out and use your voice and advocate and we will support you. So if you're a parent that says, hey, I want to get this into my school system in Arizona, contact us and we've got people that will uh, work with you to make that happen. Wonderful. Well, we do have listeners. Our top countries are the United States and then Australia is next. And then Canada and UK are very close. So I know that you've made an, an impact in all those places, but I'd like to help you get and spread the word so that more people find out about this, because this is definitely what I think is the missing link. It's been the missing link for, for me over here with my daughter, and I'm very interested to keep learning more about what you're doing in your assessments. Um, and I also saw that there was an adult strand from watching one of the videos um, for understanding that you know we've gone through our school and you've got an assessment that could pinpoint some challenges after school is that correct it, it is absolutely correct and we we've just we have a, a questionnaire on our website if people are interested it's free um, we've just done a lot of research and work on it and refined it so if people go on our website and look at the cognitive questionnaire I think there's maybe 150 questions a fair number of questions but you just go through that answer those questions and at the end of it based on your responses it will produce your cognitive profile. I mean, it's never quite as good as actually doing the assessment, but it'll give you an indication as to, you know, what might be there that that's, you know, maybe causing some challenges in your, in your career or in your work life. So, you know, I've worked with students as young as five and as old as 85. I mean, to me, it's exciting. There's neuroplasticity across our lifespan. Um, and there's this idea that I talk about a cognitive mismatch where, somebody might be very successful in, the, in their career, but there might be just a piece that is either holding them back or slowing them down. And that could be, you know, just a, a, a slight weakness or incompatibility in one of these cognitive functions. I mean, I've never met anybody yet that has every single cognitive piece at the same level. And it just kind of really depends is, is that piece that's a little weaker, something that is having an impact or not? I mean, it, it might not, but if it is, we can actually strengthen that. And one of the benefits, you know, that has come out of COVID for our organization is um, we had to pivot within three weeks because we had schools all around the world offering this program in person and all of a sudden those schools shut their doors. So we took all of our work and created an online version. So now schools have the opportunity to reach students that aren't in their geographical location through the online program. So if people are interested, we opened a whole online school, Aerosmith School Online, a lot of the other sites like in Australia, um, New Zealand, Europe also offer this online. So geography doesn't have to be a barrier. The rule of thumb is for each cognitive area that one is working on, you need between three to four hours per week uh, to affect change because you know we hear all the time yes our brain is neuroplastic whenever you do anything you're changing your brain but the kinds of changes i'm talking about are really fundamental and profound and deep and lifelong um, and they take you know some effort just like you know going to the gym and, and doing a, a workout but you know we've tracked people 30 40 years out of the program and once that cognitive capacity has been strengthened the person goes out into the world and uses it. So they don't have to keep doing the exercise. They've got that function in place and they're working it and using it, you know, throughout um, throughout their lifespan. So I would welcome people, try the cognitive questionnaire on, on the website. As a parent, you can go on and try it for your child or as an adult, you can try it for yourself um, and reach out and, and have a conversation and a dialogue with our team here in Toronto, or if there is a school, we have the participating schools on the website. If there's a school in your location, um, reach out and, and have a conversation because, you know, our commitment is to make this work accessible worldwide 
uh, no matter where you are and no matter what age you are. Um, and we're also now doing uh, work with, you know, as we're getting older, I'm getting a little older and sometimes not quite as sharp, you know, that idea of cognitive decline as we age, we're seeing benefits in, of this work, you know, just to keep our brain sharp as we age as well. Like if, if you've got a brain, you know, this work can, can stimulate and, and strengthen and, and improve that. And my heart certainly is with those students with learning difficulties. I mean, because that was my journey. Um, and though we, we've seen and done research and seen the application across um, all sorts of, of populations. This is powerful. I love it. I love every minute of this. And so I can see your vision for Aerosmith schools to build it worldwide. Um, I did see a video about an intensive you had. Um, do you offer anything like this or uh, like what's happening right now? Because I, I think Toronto's still shut down, right? Yeah, we're, we're doing our intensive online and we did it for the first time online last year. And I thought, you know, how is this going to work, right? Because, you know, I mean, online is a little different experience. And certainly we've seen in the media, like online for students with learning difficulties isn't as effective as, you know, for students without learning difficulties. But our work is very different. Like there's a lot of engagement and it's not online in the sense that the students just out there doing it by themselves. It's online with a cognitive coach and a facilitator. So those students are doing it within a virtual classroom with the, the cognitive coach slash facilitator working um, with them. And we just analyzed all the data from 2019, we did it in person and 2020, it was all online and schools, several schools around the world were doing it. We got exactly the same results. We looked at the data from progress of students moving through assessment changes, identical. So really encouraged that our online offering is as powerful as our in-person offering. So we're starting in Toronto with our online uh, cognitive intensive program, I think the end of May, and we're running several sessions. So right through the summer, if people are interested so that you can you know, do it from, from your home. And we have you know, students, we start at age nine. And, you know, again, we have students up into their 80s that that do this. And it's the exercise that I created for myself. And it's one of the most powerful exercises. If I had one gift to leave to the world, this would be be the one because it 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 impacts cognitive efficiency, processing speed, auditory processing, comprehension, you know, that deep understanding of, you know, why things happen in the world. Um, and we're, each summer we've been doing research. And in fact, yesterday I was just talking to the researcher at Southern Illinois University that we work with in the States. Um, and he's just analyzing several years when we didn't have COVID, we could do brain imaging on these students as well. I mean, we we don't want to send students into hospitals, you know, with, with COVID to have their brains imaged, but, you know, to see the changes in really critical networks, like networks, the salience network that says what's critical, what's essential, you know, what should I attend to, the executive control network, all of these, like this thinking, planning, problem solving, working memory are changing, you know, as individuals go through this um, exercise as part of the cognitive intensive program. And again, we just opened it up um, to schools all around the world that if they want to offer it, what we do is when we have sort of a new model that we're trialing, we like to kind of trial it in-house as it were and get all the data. And then we offer it out to the schools around the world. So this year, there'll be a number of, of um, educational organizations offering the cognitive intensive program. And it's, as I said, it's, we called it intense because I took the number of hours over a 10 month part-time program and I compressed them into six to eight weeks. So some schools offered over eight weeks, some over six weeks. Um, but I would highly recommend um, recommend that that program. Uh, and as I said, we used to have people when we had it in person, fly in from all around the world to come to Toronto um, to, to do that. That program and as I said there are other schools also that are that are offering that but uh, and there's a video I think that might be what you're referencing that that you know in one of the first years that we offered it all the parents coming from around the world talking about um, about what they were seeing over that that six week um, period and it, it's it's really very profound. What, what I'm capturing here is that you know that I started the podcast definitely for education for social emotional learning to help educators to implement these skills in the classroom and 
And then it turned to, we added the neuroscience piece and then we added the health and wellness. And then I actually went and got my brain scan just to have a look and see what were my areas of weakness, because how do you know if you don't look at your brain? And you mentioned that your um, the tests you developed for yourself help with processing speed. And I scored extremely low on my ability to press a key on a keyboard. And I don't know where that skill shows up in my life. I just know I scored really low on that. So I'm just curious, do you know what, what's, where would I need processing skills? What, where would that show up? Yeah. Well, well, processing speed, it could be like decision speed. So that, that could be again, what I'm talking about, like that, that, what I call the symbol relations, not, not anywhere near the level that I had it, but it just might be, it's kind of making that fast connection between I see this, I have to do this, right? Like, which is, cause I think what you're talking about is something shows up in the screen and you have to um, do a response. So it would be whether the, the, the slightly slower speed is in the response time, or is it finding that key on the keyboard? If it's finding the key on the keyboard, it could be kinesthetic. It could be a spatial piece, right? That, that you're just not fast or it could be motor planning. Um, so that to me, that's what we do in our, our assessment is pull that all apart, right? And, and say, okay, for this individual, it's this, for this other individual, it's that. And we did a, a study with a professor here at the University of Toronto a number of years ago. And he looked at the learning profiles of 1400 students that had gone through the Aerosmith assessment. And I knew the profiles were unique, but he found 70% of the students had a profile that was shared with no other student. And it, to me, it points to the complexity of our brain. I, I am in awe of the human brain. I'm in love with the human brain. Um, and it's never disappointed me ever, <laughs> you know? Uh, there's always new things to, to learn, but the brain is incredibly complex. So then the learning process incredibly complex and each one of us has our own unique profile. You know, research shows that actually, you know, if you think about somebody, you know, and there are a lot of physical differences between you and that person, like eye color, height, you know, shape of your ears. Well, there are actually more differences between your two brains than all of those physical characteristics. So it just points to the complexity of ourselves and our brain shapes us. But to me, what's exciting with neuroplasticity, yes, our brain shapes us, it mediates our understanding of our world, but actually we can shape our brain. And, and, you know, the, the difference that makes, and you talked about, you know, social emotional well-being. in one of the studies we did, we looked at cortisol because we know cortisol is a stress hormone and not, not a great, I mean, it has benefit as all hormones do, but if there's too much of it, it's not a great thing. Uh, one researcher said it's like an acid bath for the brain, which I've never been able to get that image out of my head. Um, <laughs> So it's important to reduce stress. But what we saw with this group of students going through my program is that their cortisol reduced over the course of the year, right? Because as their brain was strengthening, they had locus of control in their life. They felt they were an agent of change in their life. They could do things and feel successful and competent because their, their brain was now allowing them to do those things. And to me, that was so profound, like, because it's not just the brain, it's you know, is our our brain, as I said, shapes who we are, but it mediates our understanding of ourselves, of other people, our relationship to those people, our relationship to the world. So you change the brain, you transform the individual's reality. It, it, it's, um, I'm just humbled and in awe of the power of this work. Well, I am so grateful to have had this opportunity to speak with you today. It's a true honor to meet someone who's had such an incredible impact on the world. And it's just going to get bigger and, and better from here. I can just see it. I'm going to continue to follow your work. For anyone who wants to learn more, they can go to aerosmithschool.org and see all, all that you're doing. You can see your videos. I'll put everything in the show notes. Is there any final thoughts to leave with? Yeah, I, I would just say, um, you know, if you have a child that, that's struggling with learning, it's just like really listen deeply and be curious as to, you know, to what's going on there and 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 supportive and hunt for a solution uh, to their, their problems. Don't 
ever, you know, give up, which parents, I'm in awe of parents. Like I have this phrase called them warrior mums, like, you know, these warrior mums that are out there, you know, championing, you know, the, the futures of future of their children. Right. So I say be a warrior mum. That, that's that's my advice and reach out and connect with us, um, you know, and let's see how we can support you and your child in their journey through not just school, but as one parent said, school's just a metaphor for life. It's really a journey through life. It's so true. Thank you so much, Barbara. My pleasure. Thank you, Andrea.